Thank you. So this one is a little different from some of the ones we've just seen. Um, these are what I thought were my pertinent disclosures for this. So currently, the FDA guidelines on retained medical fragments tell people to avoid MRIs if there's any kind of retained metallic fragment. Um, we have done prior studies that we've published that showed there really wasn't an issue, but according to current product guidelines, uh, that is not what is stated. And so it can often be difficult to obtain an MRI in a patient who either has a sacral neuromodulation device or perhaps has a portion of one that was left behind. Uh, to date, there are no large studies that really look at the incidence of lead breakage. Some earlier uh, studies, some works we had done, showed that it might be as high as 18%. And it's interesting because the manufacturer estimate is that the lead breakage occurs in 1% of patients. So our objectives were really to um, identify the risk factors of lead breakage, look what things might predict it, and then actually to look beyond that and see what, what happens with these patients. So we did a, a review of all the lead removals at one institution, and we excluded patients who had failed a stage one trial. So that was a lead that would have just been in for two or three weeks. So we didn't count those. We didn't count earlier non-time leads, and we didn't count those that were removed for infection. When we looked at the number that were removed, there were 464 leads that were removed in 298 unique patients. Uh, the majority of these patients were females. If you look at the mean time since the implant, it was roughly three years. And the vast majority of lead, these leads had been placed at our own institution. And in many of the patients, the patients uh, were getting a revision. The region for lead removal, there were a number of different reasons, but ultimately it was generally because of loss of efficacy was the primary reason. So when we looked at all these leads that were removed, we had 35 that actually broke during removal, which is a rate of 7.5%. One thing that we noted right away was there seemed to be a little bit of a time difference so that those that came out intact in general had been in the patient for a shorter uh, time. So when we looked at various risk factors or things that might predict for lead breakage, one very significant was one was male gender, diabetes, and a shorter time interval actually seemed to be protective. All of the other things we looked at really didn't pan out. Now, it's interesting, when you look at the surgical technique for removing a lead, the manufacturer recommends removing it at the lead placement site, not from the IPG pocket. Um, in our practice, there are people do things differently. Some actually remove it from an incision over uh, where the IPG would be. Some remove it directly over the sacral foramen, and we have one of our, my colleagues who actually removes it from the sacral foramen, but passes a little wire through it before he pulls on it. Uh, he, he, feels that that may strengthen it and, and make it a little uh, straighter. And this is just an example of him putting the, the, uh, a little wire inside the lead. Now, when we looked at the various techniques, there was really no difference in the rate of breakage based on which of those techniques were used. When we looked at the surgeon, though these are the four surgeons and the rates, it looks a little different. A looks a lot less, but when you actually do the statistics, there was not a statistically significant difference amongst the surgeons. We also looked at where does it seem to break. So we looked at the ones that we actually had radiologic imaging after it was pulled out, and essentially we defined it as did it break above the tines, in the midst of the tines, or beyond the tines, and that can be seen on x-ray. And of the 27 of those patients did have x-rays, afterwards, and the vast majority, two-thirds of them, actually broke between the tines. When you look at, this is sort of, I know somebody's going to gasp when they see this picture, but I put it in here because it actually shows a lot of good things. What about ghost fragments? People sometimes talk about ghost fragments, which are when it breaks and the internal wire actually comes out, leaving just the outer portion. So this is a patient that obviously had had a number of revisions, and what you see here is this is the new lead that's put in that's intact. Here's a lead that is broken. However, the actual inner wire is still there. And then finally, here's one that we call a ghost lead where it's broken, but the inner wire is no longer there. And this has been assumed to be a little safer if it stays in. What we found is that four to five of the patients that we did, or 80%, actually had these ghost leads. And then finally, what happened to these patients? Many of these patients did go on to have another interstim placed. 
Uh, a few of them did go on to have MRIs of the body without any issues. And there was one patient who actually had a new lead placed that was right next to the fragment and was getting pain probably from some conduction issues there that did need uh, to go back and remove that small fragment. So overall, rate of lead breakage, while low, is a lot higher than what's reported. Uh, the risk factors seem to be male gender, diabetes, and time interval since lead implant. Surgical technique did not alter it, and most of those leads do break within the tines and turn out to be a ghost lead. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one short question. Any question? Yeah. So it seems clear that the longer the, 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 the lead is in there, the harder the... the, the so that, that was one of the things. I think the, the thing for me that was most impressive was the male gender, which when you look in the orthopedic literature and some other uh, areas, actually the, the uh, lumbodorsal fascia in men seems to be thicker and has a much higher shear, uh, shear strength. So that may explain why there's a difference between men and women. But I mean, in the big picture, most of them come out fine. And although there are these MRI issues currently, my sense is that from a practical clinical standpoint, it probably doesn't make much of a difference. Sure, question, uh, please. Mike Ruggieri from Philadelphia again. I, I thought the MRI was worried that it would make a move. Did you see that the MRI and the patients that had the MRI, did they displace the implant at all? Or so, so the real worried the about real, heating it? Yeah, the real MRI issue is either heating or conduction. It's unusual that these are going to move because they're usually pretty scarred in. And we've done, we've published a number of papers on this. The concern is really heating or perhaps conduction. Um, but it, with our prior papers where we've actually done MRIs in these patients, in general, it's usually not an issue. Okay, thank you so much. For